excited y'all for our guest tonight. He's one of my favorite returning guests, so I cannot wait. And uh, on that note, what do you say we go ahead and get started, Sasha? Sounds great. Okay, well, let's go ahead and start out the way we always do, which is with a poll for the audience so we can hear from you all. Let me go ahead and launch that. And this poll is a little different uh, than a couple of them because the first question is not really a question. So you don't have to answer the first one, but Rob gave us a couple of definitions to work with so you can answer the other questions in the poll. So I'll go ahead and read those to you. Um, so first uh, we have two definitions. One, the supernatural is defined as phenomena or entities that are not subject to the laws of nature. And two, paranormal events are purported phenomena whose existence is described as being beyond the scope of normal scientific understanding. And like I said, you don't have to answer those. That's just meant to help you answer these next questions, which are, have you had an experience you believe is evidence for the reality of the paranormal or the supernatural? Do you believe there is good evidence for paranormal or supernatural claims? Do you believe you possess paranormal abilities? And I'm going to be really interested if people put yes on this to hear what, what they are. And finally, for those who left a religion and now consider themselves non-religious, do you believe fewer paranormal claims, believe more paranormal claims, have not changed your belief in the paranormal or not applicable, you were never religious or have not left a religion? So we'll give y'all a few minutes to answer those and see what we come out with. And Some great questions in there. Really good I questions. I'm I think really so, interested. Yeah, for many of us who have come from that religious background, um, the whole paranormal, whether we call it ghosts or goblins or ghouls or whether we call them demons, it was a central part of our life. So very interesting to see how that translates now that we've sort of left that behind for most of us. Yes, I'm really interested uh, to see the results on that. I bet we'll pull that back up later in the show to discuss. So put your answers in there. And uh, in the meanwhile, um, Sasha, while we're there answering that, do you want to tell us a little bit about what we're doing here? What is RFRX anyway? Yeah, thank you. So for those who might be here for the first time, welcome. It's really great to have you along. So RFRX is a special program that we have once a week, and it's an opportunity for us to invite guests on who are experts in their fields to talk about topics that are of interest to them and in turn interest to us in the greater community. And today is a fantastic example of that. Topics that are relevant to us, particularly if we're on a journey out of religion. So as part of the recovering from religion community. Now it's not the replacement for our online community. Uh, you may be familiar that we have all of these provisions available here through Recovering From Religion to support one another. And it's also not a replacement of our support groups. As we know, we've got so many support groups, which we'll chat about in a moment. Um, but this is an opportunity to sit here as a guest to view the program rather than interact um, as the support groups take place. So it's a bit of a way that we can have good advice, coping skills, suggestions, guidance, and education. Because I think one thing is true of all of us as we are on this journey, we're open to learn new things and to open our minds and not be stuck in an old way of thinking. So these RFIRX presentations are a great example of how we can learn new things and expand our mind. Um, if you've ever got any thoughts or suggestions for a topic that you think might be relevant for an RFIRX presentation, feel free to send it through to us. You can do that through the RFIX at recoveringfromreligion.org email and just send us through thoughts, suggestions, ideas for speakers. And of course, all the previous presentations, and I think we have about 100 of these that we've done over the last few years, can be found on our YouTube page. So if you just go to Recovering From Religion, um, search that on YouTube, you'll find all of the presentations have been uploaded and we're adding new ones every week. So uh, go through, you'll see a variety of topics covered. I, I can't even think of the amount of topics, Cara, but maybe you've got more of an idea of things we've spoken about. Oh yeah, so many topics. We've got topics that are about coping skills, like you mentioned. We have people coming in to talk about their experiences in particular uh, faiths that they left. We have people coming in to teach us skills, like how Rob is going to talk later about skepticism or critical thinking or street epistemology, just people talking about new books that they've come out with, all sorts of interesting things. So if there's a topic that you're looking for that might be vaguely related to anything we've said, I bet there's an episode on there for you. So go check it out. Fantastic. Awesome. Thank you. So can you tell us more about what recovering from religion is? If people aren't familiar, tell us more about recovering from religion and our focus. 
yes, I would love to. So yeah, we've said RFR a few times. That stands for Recovering from Religion. And our mission statement is to offer hope, healing, and support to those who are struggling with issues of doubt and non-belief. And so we primarily do that um, through three, three ways. Um, and we'll talk about each of them. Uh, but Something I wanted to mention too, um, we talked earlier a few minutes ago about how, you know, people may or may not be celebrating things like Father's Day or Juneteenth or Pride this month, uh, depending on where you live. And that just kind of reminded me too that, you know, we're coming from so many different diverse life experiences and social locations that really, you know, people come from these sort of intersections of, of experiences and social identities that really have impacted their experience of, you know, religious community and non religious religious community and, and what they're seeking in that. And I just wanted to, to acknowledge that and, and mention too that at Recovering from Religion, we really do want to be a supportive and, and safe place for, for people to find that community and that hope and the healing and the support. So this is this is the place for that to take place. And first of all, Sasha, do you want to talk a little bit about how we offer healing? Sure. And you make a really valid point there that we really want to meet people where they're at. And the whole process of recovering from religion can be a, a traumatic one. So the healing aspect of our mission statement, it comes down from having an amazing amount of volunteers in our team who are here just to listen, support with an empathetic ear, um, provide uh, validation, provide assistance in navigating the, your way out of wherever you might be. Um, the most important thing is there's no judgment, there's no criticism, and there's no expectation that people have to think a particular way. We're not asking for people to be clones here in the recovering from religion community. We respect everybody's personal journey. Now you can contact us through a 24 hour, seven day a week phone support line, which you can find on the main page of recovering from religion. Or if you don't feel comfortable picking up the phone and talking to somebody, there's a chat feature available on the main page. You can just type anonymously and you will get really fantastic trained volunteers there to receive that chat and provide guidance and they have at their disposal an abundance of resources so it really doesn't matter what the topic is that you might be looking for support and assistance on they've got resources available from professionals in their field to assist so somebody might be phoning up or contacting us saying how do I navigate a mixed faith relationship you know I, I don't believe anymore but my partner does and we're not sure what to do with our children um, well there's fantastic resources available about how to navigate a successful mixed faith relationship that's just one example that comes to mind so feel free to check out the main page of recovering from religion have a look there at all of the resources tabs and contact any of our trained volunteers at any time Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that is that is a great place to start. Uh, and the next thing uh, that we try to offer is hope. And that is primarily something that we do through sharing and listening to personal stories. And kind of the thought process behind that is that we're all in this together, even if we're coming from different places, um, we're experiencing different things. Sometimes it can be really helpful, inspirational, encouraging uh, to hear from someone else's experience and kind of see how they were able to get through something and, and some of the, the growth that they experienced and, and learn from and kind of you know support each other that way. And so we have along those lines, both a blog and a podcast that you can check out. And I'm gonna drop the links to both of those um, in the chat. So again, just like how we have all of those previous episodes on YouTube and all of the resources Sasha was mentioning, we also have sort of a wealth of information here too. If you wanna read some of those personal stories and insights, um, be sure and do check those out. And then- Excellent support sasha what do you have for us <laughs> well a lot of people would be familiar that one of the biggest um uh, provisions or aspects of recovering from religion are the support groups you would have heard us speak about these on a variety of podcasts and shows all, all throughout the world we have um around 60 support groups um and they are located all over the states, Europe, Australia, you name it. And these support groups, of course, are online at the moment, particularly during the pandemic, we moved them to online Zoom meetings, which has opened up um, the ability for people to join from all parts of the world. We do have some in-person support groups as well that are starting up again now, but we invite you to go through to the main page. You'll have a look there. There's a list of all the different support groups available. Now you don't have to attend the one in your local area. It's not like church where you're expected to 
to the, attend the local one. You can attend any of these support groups all around the world. Now, these support groups provide peer support, not necessarily trained therapists, but just peers that understand what we're going through. They provide a safe space for us to talk um, and express what we're going through and other people to provide that guidance, that support, that friendship that we need during this uh, change in our, in our life. So I really encourage you to join them. I've been part of the support groups now for several years and I have really been benefited to personally and the ability also then to assist other people is so important because one of the best ways to help yourself is to help other people. So yeah, join the support groups. I think you'll find that's really important and that's peer support. But sometimes we need a little bit more than just peer support. We need trained therapists to assist us. Kara, can you tell us more about that? Yes, thank you for that lead in. That is exactly where the Secular Therapy Project comes in. And that is uh, what we use to help you connect with a licensed secular mental health care provider if you decide that that is what you're looking for. Um, and this is a place uh, where you can find uh, mental health providers who are carefully screened for a few criteria. One is that they are appropriately licensed in their state and or country. Two is that they maintain a secular practice. And what that means is that they're not doing any proselytizing. They're not going to tell you things like, you know, well, you need to go home and pray about it or, you know, connect more with your, your crystals and, you know, your inner energy fields or whatever. Um, they're they're going to be using only the third thing, which is um, exclusive use of evidence-based treatments. Um, so that is some place where if you're looking for a mental health care provider, you can be assured that they've already been vetted um, and that that's, that's what you'll be receiving um, if you go there. And let me drop the link to that in the chat. And if you go to the, the website, seculartherapy.org, um, it has all of the information there for how to get started and how to connect with someone in your area. Um, I think they also have, have virtual um, offerings as well, depending on, on who you connect with, but that's all, all handled through the website. Um, but feel free to check that out. I know a lot of people have found that to be very helpful as well, in addition to um, some of the peer support and other things that we do here. Speaking of which, we also have our online community, um, which is again back to back to peer uh, support. This is uh, just our online platform that we use to to help people meet those with similar backgrounds, um, and we have it's kind of our way of forming another sort of community that a lot of people kind of feel like that is what they're missing when they leave religion. Um, they miss out on having that you know every Sunday get together with familiar people, and so we have things like Sunday night Zoom meetings in the online community that you can join. Um, and you can also join little subgroups within the, the online community that are directed at people who might have a similar background as you, whether that's something like, okay, I'm a I'm interested in secular parenting, or I'm a former military person, or I'm a member of the LGBTQ community, or anything like that. I'm a former Jehovah's Witness, all sorts of groups like that with other people who may have similar experiences as you that you might feel comfortable sharing with. So that is something that you can join by contacting one of our helpline agents, and you'll have a little chat with them, and they just make sure that it sounds like it's a good fit for you. It's not open to anybody in the world. You have to go through this process to get into it, so that's how we try to make sure it's not full of trolls or anything like that, um, and that it is a safe place to be. Um, so if you're interested, interested in that, just go ahead and reach out to one of the helpline agents and they'll get you set up. And then uh, finally, we have our Atheist Community of Discord. That is that is not through us, that is our good friends uh, from the ACA uh, that are also streaming this right now. Um, so welcome to anybody that's watching um, through there. But that is another great community uh, that you can get involved in if you're interested in meeting with other non-believers, the atheist communities who are more um, out and open about that. And they have some really interesting discussions and areas on Discord as well that you can get involved in. So I dropped the link for that in the chat as well. So go Fantastic. and build your community. <laughs> All right, Wonderful. Sasha, what about volunteering? We well, get the last thing before we lead into our fantastic show is volunteering. We are always looking for new people to assist us here at Recovering from Religion. As you know, nobody gets paid for what they do here. This is a wonderful group of volunteers who make themselves available. And, you know, there's so many different ways you could volunteer with us. You could either be part of a support group. You might like to assist that in, in your local area. You might like to start one up. Or you might think, I'm not as good with people, but I'm really good at behind the scenes stuff. Well, we're always looking for somebody maybe with tech skills or administration skills who might be able to help us build our programs behind the scenes. 
Um, whatever it is that you feel impelled to do, contact us, let us know if you're available. Um, and again, unlike church, there's no expectation. You give what you're, what you're capable of. Um, and, uh, you know, we appreciate anything that people make available. The most important thing is here at Art Recovering From Religion, we're all about people. And people is the most important thing. So whatever you might feel impelled to do to support other people, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd, we'd love to have you as part of the team. Thanks. And, and we didn't even play the hypnotic music during the, the call to action, which we learned <laughs> last week would have helped a lot. But, <laughs> but we're not here to manipulate anyone. <laughs> Love oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> you can find all of those um, links on the main page, and that's the easiest way. Just the main page of the website, yeah. and you'll see all of those uh, provision, all of those uh, links there available for you. Yeah, recoveringfromreligion.org. Start there. You'll find all this stuff. I promise. If if I can navigate that website, anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, so uh, as you said, let's go ahead and dive into the actual show. Um, as we always do on Monday nights, we'll start out with a discussion uh, with our speaker that'll last for about an hour, um, and we'll have Q&A after that. Um, and what helps us have Q&A is if people have questions. So go ahead and feel free to type your questions into the chat as we go along. And in this episode, we're going to try and get to some of those questions as we go. Rob, our guest, is going to be answering answering questions um, as we go through the, the presentation. So if you have a burning question that you want to ask, put it in the chat. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. We may not get to all of them, but we will be collecting them and we'll try to cover the others um, that we don't get to at the end. Um, and then after that, we'll have a few closing thoughts from the fabulous and amazing Helen Green, um, who will who will sum up the evening for us. And then we'll go straight into our hangout where we turn off the camera and get to kind of continue the conversation and uh, people can come off mute and actually chat and talk and ask more questions and comments. So without further ado, let's get into this. I am so pleased to be able to introduce our guest, who's one of my favorite returning guests, Rob Palmer. And Rob is a guerrilla skepticism on Wikipedia team member and skeptical activist who writes for Skeptical Inquirer as the well-known skeptic. He does public speaking and writing about contemporary skeptical issues and has interviewed conference speakers, scientists, TV personalities, including Star Trek's Q, who plays a deity, um, and many skeptical <laughs> and atheist activists. He takes a special interest in combating dangerous beliefs and educating the public about the harm that often befalls vulnerable victims who trust in people who are making paranormal and supernatural claims. And while claims like these are commonly believed, Rob is going to remind us that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So tonight we will be examining how good the evidence is for some common paranormal and supernatural beliefs, as well as why so many people believe extraordinary claims without sufficient evidence. So Rob, are you here? I am here. Take I'm it away. This is my hat trick. Three times in RFRS. <laughs> I am so excited. I think I've been here for all three of your talks too, and they're some of my favorites. Thank you. But this one, this one stands out. But and not only here, anywhere. Because normally, uh, as a skeptical activist, you don't go and talk about skepticism as a topic. You talk about a particular topic that's of interest to skeptics. Like I've done, talk, done talks about the harm in believing in psychics, mm -hmm. and uh, the Gorilla Skeptics Project, and critical thinking specifically. But this is about, I'm going to be covering what is what it is to be an activist skeptic, what is it to be a skeptic, what is a skeptical movement, like what are, uh, you know, what, what are the important things to, to have a skeptical mindset about things, um, that sort of thing. So it's going to be more general. And then, as you said, we will talk about some of the specific topics that are perhaps of more interest to people coming out of a religion than than some of the other things, because the skepticism covers a lot of things, including vaccine denial and, you know, global warming denial and things like that, too. Um, you know, the whole ultimate thing is a big topic in skepticism, especially because it resulted in the COVID anti-vax movement. Um, but you know, we're going to be talking about this is going to be more about, uh, I would call it old fashioned. Well, not quite. I was going to say old fashioned skepticism, but that's more Bigfoot and UFOs. So this is more well, of the stuff. Yeah. Well, okay. let, let me ask you something, if I can, Rob, before you go into it. So a lot of us that came from religion, the word skeptic was a taboo word. You know, we were taught to look down on anyone who was skeptical that they were, that this was a misleading, you know, a bad thing. Can you explain what 
the word actually means in the proper terms. So from Stephen Novella, who is uh, the head of New England Skeptical Society and one of the biggest skeptic podcasts there is, A Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, I highly recommend. He said, being a functional skeptic requires knowledge of all the various ways in which we deceive ourselves, the limits and flaws in human perception and memory, the inherent biases and fallacies in cognition, and the methods that can help mitigate all of these flaws and biases. It's basically so we don't fool ourselves and we don't get fooled by other people. Mm. Brilliant. Love that quote. So that is and one of the reasons I think it's important to talk about the topics we're going to talk about uh, to, to this community specifically is because, this is another quote by Steve Novella, coincidentally, uh, I think that when you're raised to believe in life after death, angels, demons, ghosts, and other such religious pseudoscience, then paying someone to speak to the dead and get messages back isn't much of a leap. Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect he was talking specifically about people believing in mediumship there but it it just goes you know on to some of the other beliefs in new age uh you know mysticism and stuff so definitely interesting so you know that's that's a really good point that you make there um rob that it seems like you've kind of made a, a connection uh between some of these beliefs uh that a lot of people have uh if they are in a religious environment where you're believing in angels and demons and things like that um are, are you suggesting then that uh that sort of programs people to not be as skeptical about other um potentially uh yeah, dangerous absolutely, claims Car, absolutely uh you know you're, you're basically told to listen to authority to to believe that there's this other realm without really any evidence for it or any good evidence, I shall say. Um, mm. you, you're told to believe it because other people believe it because you know, the authority figures in your church say it's true. And none of these are good reasons to believe anything. And we're gonna go into that a little bit later, the logical fallacies that people use uh, to convince other people things are true that aren't, that have no good evidence for and the things you in fact convince yourself of because you think fallaciously also. So we'll talk about that too, I hope. Oh, excellent. Okay, I'm excited. Well, tell us a little bit more about what is the, the skeptical movement? What, what is this all about? And how'd you get involved in it? Well, so the movement has to do with, you know, or an organized pushback on, uh, on when I say fake news, uh, <laughs> you know, this has been going on for a, a very long time. And there's all different things that the movement has been pushed back on initially, you know, what was what was in the media all the time were UFOs and alien abductions and crop circles. And, uh, you know, we still have those things. People have been paying attention to the, you know, to the leaked Navy UFO reports that, uh, that keep appearing and CNN covers and ABC and all the news stations, like it's new stuff and it's new, it's, you know, real new revelations. Mm. Like skeptic, don't forget Bigfoot, Yeti and giant worms and, and all and of these sorts of things as giant well. Giant worms. You'll have to tell me about that later. I don't, I don't know about that specific <laughs> one. We've um, got a new one. Sasha started a new one. Worm. This is, that was a tr movie Tremors, I think, or something like that. But I remember so, that. So if, if you're interested to find out about the movement itself, there's a Wikipedia article, and I'm going to be talking a lot about Wikipedia, because one of the things I do is edit Wikipedia with a team of scientific skeptics, is uh, the article on scientific skepticism itself. I'm going to share that screen now. And I think someone could put this in the chat. So this defines what it means to be a scientific skeptic, uh, also called a rational, a rational skeptic. And, and the process is sometimes referred to as skeptical inquiry. And it gives a good understanding of what the movement is about. Um, it's interesting because Wikipedia is a living you know, thing. So the articles have changed over time. So this, which I just clicked to now, did it change? By the way, I can't tell if I'm doing a share screen if that works. Can you see yeah, this That's now? perfect, perfect. Yes. So you can see the following quotation related to science. Yes. Okay, good. So that's good. It shares the whole browser. That's good to know. Okay, so this is an older version that has a lot of quotes about what is scientific skepticism, which was your first question. And you can, by the way, in Wikipedia, you can also go back to the history tab and pull up any old version of a page. So this is about a year ago. These were on the page and they are no longer on the page, but I think they're, they're worth to talk about now. So it boils down uh, to construct and understand a reasoned argument, especially important to recognize a fallacious or fraudulent argument, as I mentioned before, mm. right? 
Uh, Carl Sagan said, it's a way of skeptically interrogating the universe with a fine understanding of human fallibility. And it's interesting that he said science, because in fact, a lot of times what science does is it pushes the envelope of our understanding, but then it's just assumed by scientists that now we understand that we'll move on. But the fact is, it's up to scientific skeptics to like hold the line there because the, and the other people you know, go crazy with it and they, they forget what we learned or they ignore what we learned. And it's not scientists job to do that piece of the job. So that's kind of the purview of scientific skepticism. Um, you know, clearly here, uh, Daniel Loxton said, it, it's the practice of studying the paranormal through the scientific claims through the lens of science, right? And this goes on. So you could you know, look, look at these um, on your own later, but basically, it's, it's a combination of backing up what science says and uh, pushing back on discredited uh, things that are being said. And it's also a means of consumer protection, especially when we get to the area of people being taken advantage of by con artists, psychics, uh, mediums, um, people selling uh, snake oil, you know, not literally mm. anymore, but that's what they do. <laughs> Well, and I think we've we've had maybe it's not like you said, not literally snake oil, but I think there are plenty of people selling purported miracle drugs right now. Yep. So. And what surprised me, I, I didn't know this when I first heard that term, that was a thing that is the bottle and it said snake oil. I don't know if it really was mm. from a snake, but that is what they sold to do all these magical cures. Wow. And people you're, you're fell saying. For it. Yeah, it, it, it shows the human tendency. People are looking to believe in something. Is that Absolutely. why the skeptic movement is so important to help people from being exploited? Absolutely. And uh, it's a shame that a lot of people don't understand that and they'll push back on us like, you know, why you just don't believe anything? Why are you being so cynical? It's like, yeah, no, we believe the truth. <laughs> right. We'll, we'll help you figure out what is true. Put it that way. So you don't get taken advantage of. Are you saying that we do our own research? Mm, with, the, with, with the help of people who have targeted that. I see several people who have done this kind of research have joined the meeting. That's fantastic. And they're gonna, their, their ears are going to ring if they stay on. Excellent. Excellent. I am super excited. Well, tell us more about this, Rob. What, what kind of topics um, fall under skepticism or skeptical inquiry um, that you could tell us a little bit more about? Okay, so it's it's a whole bunch of things. I'm going to share this page from Wikipedia, which is <laughs> so you can label a, any article in Wikipedia at, with a project, and these are the projects that are under Project Skepticism, and these are the page names. Look who's number one: Marjorie mm. Taylor Greene. Uh oh, <laughs> giant space lasers. <laughs> it's Jewish space lasers, as I think. That's the uh, one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, and, and QAnon and and the, the Catholic Church is run is run by Satan, and yeah, those are the latest ones of hers. Um, some of these I can tell you why they're here, and some I don't understand. Are right, Tesla's all the time? Anybody who's into quantum, you know, whatever. Oh, Tesla was like held down because you know people didn't know one because that he created free energy and people didn't mm. want him. You know, you didn't know Gwyneth Paltrow. Oh, oh. I have written about her <laughs> numerous times because of her uh, our Goop and the Netflix show The Goop Lab. Mm. Um, uh. Jenny McCarthy, anti-vax, oh. and we got QAnon. Mm. So this is this is a mixed bag of people, of topics that you might recognize, Bermuda Triangle, um, you know, scientists, because, mm. hey, some people don't believe Charles Darwin was actually, uh, you know, legitimate. Oh, Quantum mechanics, why would that be there? Because it's a field of physics. Well, you know why? Because everybody who wants you to believe something crazy with no evidence says, oh, you don't understand it because it's quantum mechanics. So, mm. I've that's heard a that word before. That <laughs> yeah, easily thrown around word um, um so some religious got... things shroud of turin right so mm -hmm. yep dunning kruger effect you've got there too that's an interesting one we've often heard that referred to absolutely um there are people that you might not know their names but uh they're famous tv personalities like tyler henry there's somebody mm -hmm. on this uh on the session right now has written tons about mr tyler henry i'll be talking about that a little bit but anyway so so we have topics that run the gamut Excellent. Okay. And so we're, we're, there's no way we're going to be able to get into all of those this evening, but I think you're going to go over a few of them for us in a little bit. So I cannot wait, but these are great resources you're sharing here. I think you, uh, you might have some books that you're going to tell us mm -hmm. about as well, right? Yeah. So 
Um, because there are books, there are huh, YouTube videos, there are there are podcasts. So I'm going to just tell you about a few of my favorite ones. Uh, I will put them in the chat right now. So if you have it open. So, uh, you know, the first one I found was the SGU, which, sorry for abbreviating, I'll tell you what that is. It's a Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Uh, I mentioned that before. That's like probably the number one skeptic and science podcast. Um, and they have a new one coming out too, I believe. Uh, a new what? A new book coming out as well. A new book, right. Well, so that's the name of their book too. So this, these are podcast names, but you're correct. Uh, they, right. they have a book. I'll get to that. Uh, and they have a new book coming out. That's right. So uh, Sasha's up on this. So uh, The Skeptic Zone is from Australia, a fantastic resource, even though you'd say, well, it's Australian, but they cover things of interest to Americans and they have Americans like Susan Garbeck and me on there uh, periodically. Uh, and even people from Canada, like I don't know if Adrian Hill is here, but uh, she's one of the speakers. And uh, let's see, Skeptoid is fantastic. That's a really short segment, 10 minutes maybe, if you're listening or reading it shorter, it, like one particular topic every week. I used to use this all the time for friends at work who said, oh, Rob, did you hear about the giant crystal skulls? Those prove there were giants on the earth, just like in the Bible. So, okay, <laughs> like Google Skeptoid crystal skull. Yep, they did an episode on that. And then I just send him the transcript because every audio episode has a text transcript for people who refuse to listen to audio. Mm. <laughs> Point of Inquiry is the podcast of the organization that I write for. Uh, so that's a, that's a good one too. Um, so, yeah. so, so uh, you mentioned books. Obviously, there's so many books. Uh, I don't even know where to begin. But I'll, I'll, you know, just some of the ones that are go-to standards, The Demon Haunted World by Carl Sagan, uh, Why People Believe Weird Things, uh, Sharma, The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, as Sasha mentioned, as a book, a really fantastic resource to understand uh, and, and to think more critically in your own life. You know, just the to, really yeah, astute I, viewers may notice one of those books is on the shelf behind me. Uh, hey, my, my <laughs> video panel view is not large enough to tell which one, which yeah, one is mine it? is either. I have the uh, why people believe weird things okay. back there, the, the Michael Shermer, very, very fun book. Although the demon haunted world is another of my favorites with the baloney detection kit. Yes. <laughs> And how, even though it was written 20 odd years ago, 30 years ago, was it? Demon Haunted World? It, um, Probably that long. I read it as a yeah, young, young person. Yeah. When I so much of it stacks up. Man's clothes, I'll say. And, <laughs> yeah, he was able to see how, you know, particularly the how social media or how the, the news networks would uh, perhaps become more polarised and, and give us misinformation. It was very interesting, um, but still very relevant and if anyone's worried about not keeping up with all these links and these excellent references that rob's telling us about we'll make sure that we we put them in the chat but we'll also put them as a post at the bottom of the youtube video once it's uploaded oh, yeah thank you and, and also so the page that i pointed to before scientific skepticism on wikipedia has a section notable skeptic media and there's a whole separate one list of notable skeptics conferences organizations so everything i talk about will be somewhere in one of these things Thank you. Excellent. That is super helpful because there's no way we're going to remember all this, but you've given us a That's ton of reading. <laughs> yes. You've given us homework. Y'all didn't know we were going to have homework on tonight's show, but surprise. <laughs> so Rob, tell us, were you always a, a skeptic? Were you always like, you know, open to things or were you closed-minded before? How, what's your journey? Yeah, when I came out of the womb, I, I was a skeptic and I didn't believe anything anyone told me. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> like, my, like most young people in the 70s, I, I, it was my time. So worse than I would say for people growing up now, because there was no internet. Someone had a TV show about, you know, Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster on one of the three channels we could watch. That was pretty much it. You couldn't like go and find the Google search. Uh, maybe you walked five miles to the library and hoped to find the books, but you know who's going to do that? Right. And, and we a lot believe of the books in the was... library were like mystical books about these things, like they're real, especially UFOs, which yeah. I found and was really into. Oh yeah, people are being abducted. There's aliens on the moon. There are all these different races. Um, Loch Ness monsters and pretty much and... every every person who I talk to who is now an active skeptic was like that at least as a teenager. Yeah, and I, yeah. I was I was absolutely no exception. There was a famous TV show too that we were all uh, Leonard Nimoy from Star Trek hosted, oh, yeah. and that was a shocking show that made us almost made real, make things look real that we're Absolutely. not. Absolutely, the science officer, the Enterprise, is telling us that Bigfoot is a real thing and aliens mm. are real, you know, besides Vulcans, because we know those <laughs> are real. 
<laughs> mm. <laughs> Unfortunate. Yeah. So, so what, what changed your mind? What got you to the point where you're at now? Well, uh, interestingly, really weird turn of events. I write for a magazine now called Skeptical Inquirer, and that was the magazine I found in the library as a teenager that had a cover story on, I don't remember which one it was, but it might've been the Shroud of Turin or, uh, or uh, like uh, the face on Mars or something like that. And you go, wow, that's cool. I'm gonna read about this. And it's like, oh, it's saying it's not true. Oh my God, there's evidence that it doesn't make any sense. All the stuff they're saying about it in the news are just wrong. Like, what is this? And then what's interesting is some of the stuff you say, oh yeah, I never believed that. I never believed that. Of course, that's ridiculous. But wait a minute, I thought this was real. Mm -hmm. But so getting a, a subscription to that magazine and reading all of the articles and you know the thorough investigations that were done into these things just made it clear that most of what you hear about those kinds of claims are just nonsense. And it wasn't that long that you know I pretty much did 180 degrees on it. Wow. Well, good thing you came across that magazine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one might say it was fate. <gasps> but you wouldn't or, say that. No, I would. Or a sign. <laughs> a sign from uh, Carl Sagan. Um, yeah. But So then how did you go from reading that magazine to getting really involved in this, you know, whole movement and, and writing for said magazine and so on? So the podcasts were my entry uh, way. Um, I was really into astronomy. I had always been my whole life. I had a, a telescope as a little kid. And the first thing I did when I found out about podcasting and I got an iPod was to uh, try to find science podcasts. And one of them was uh, the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe came up when I, mm. when I Googled universe. It's like, mm. whoa, that's cool. And it was to this. And, and it was partly about science, but it was also about this thing I'd really had just dropped as it, uh, you know, once I started not to believe those things as a teenager, I went decades without, okay, this is all nonsense. That's all I need to know. I don't have to worry about it. But then a big, wow, there's a movement that tries to help other people figure out that this is nonsense. Uh, and mm -hmm. the Skeptics Guide to the Universe at the time had already been running maybe six or seven years. I went back and I listened to every weekly episode. Uh, I was unemployed at the time. So I did it while I was house cleaning or food shopping or whatever. And, and I caught up and I've been listening to every episode since. And of course, they talk about other things like there are conferences and there are these magazines, none of which I knew except for Skeptical Inquirer. Um, and then I found out about the Skeptic Zone and I started listening to the Skeptic Zone from Australia. And uh, a woman named Susan Gerbic was on it, who's on, I see her on the screen right here. Susan Gerbic was talking about her organization of the Guerrilla Skeptics on Wikipedia and how you could fight nonsense and pseudoscience in the world's most important source of information, Wikipedia. And I said, oh, this is cool. Let me, let me look up and Google some of this stuff. So I Googled it and I found out that there was an astrology site which was saying Susan Garbick was the devil. People on her team were evil. And, I, and then that's it, sign me up. <laughs> uh, Susan, can we just confirm you are not in fact the devil? Yeah, you're... <laughs> it actually has a hat with... <laughs> to me, you know, that to me. Well, that's exactly what the devil would do. So, that is exactly yeah. right. so, hmm. so, so I joined the Guerrilla Skeptics. Um, I started editing. What, what the team does is we edit Wikipedia within the rules of Wikipedia. It's very strict, uh, you know, to add science, to take out claims that don't have evidence, the, the paranormal, supernatural things, pseudoscience, really, really uh, you know, incorrect stuff. We write pages from scratch. We improve pages that, that exist. We make smaller edits that are maybe, you know, small, but very important. And one of the really interesting things is since this project has been in existence, um, 116 million page views for the pages that Susan and the team have done. Wow. Uh, it, it's an astounding impact on the world that this could be done. And this is because Wikipedia is, you know, it is literally the number one source of inf information in the English speaking world now. Mm -hmm. Like the only websites which get more traffic than Wikipedia are Google itself, YouTube and Facebook, and maybe one other one like that. Wow. But, you know, they're not information sources. So if people want information, they're going, as you know now, if you ask Alexa or Siri for some information, it pulls it from Wikipedia too. So mm -hmm. journalists use it and they'll write, they'll read what we wrote and then write it into their articles. We have the evidence of this on USA Today and CNN and things like that. So the impact is amazing. Wow. Well, thank you all for what you're doing to help make the world a better place. So, so you know, my story was, I was really happy doing that. It's anonymous. 
Um, and then I decided, well, I, I did a talk about this at one of the skeptical conferences, SciCon, to promote it and try to get other people to join. And I also wrote an article because I did that about it and sent it into the magazine, the same magazine that I found when I was a teenager. And they published it. I was like, I didn't know that would happen, but they did. And then a week later, I got, hey, that was really good. You want to come and work for us? So it's like, ah, uh, <laughs> yes. I don't have any questions. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Well, wait a minute. You, you weren't skeptical about anything? <laughs> well, the guy who contacted me, uh, I knew his name and because he's like written like 50 books and he's the one who invented the term chupacabra and uh, well, yeah, whatever. He wrote the book on the chupacabra. He's like, he, he's like a, a really well-known paranormal investigator and he's a deputy editor of the magazine. So yeah, no, I wasn't skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That sounds amazing. I wish people would just offer me jobs like that, but I don't. So we have blame two other people at least here that write for the same magazine, Susan Gerbic, and I saw Kenny Biddle before. I think he's still here. Wave, hey. Kenny, if anyone sees you on the screen. Hey, there he is. So we're going to talk about Kenny a little bit later, and Susan's work maybe on the specific topics because uh, oh, they're excellent. into these things. Excellent. I am so glad that you brought your friends as well. Well, let's get into some of these topics. What are uh... What are some topics that you want to talk about? I know we sort of touched already on uh, religiosity and, and how that might uh, impact belief in the supernatural or the paranormal. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so let me share this. So this was a Pew Research poll, oh. and it uh, looked at religiosity, and I'll scroll up to the top, New Age beliefs common among both religious and non-religious Americans. It broke it down. Uh, interestingly, they did Christian. I don't know why they didn't break it up into other religions too. But so the one that really, uh, you know, I have found very interesting because I talk about the harm in believing in psychics is the second column, belief in psychics. Mm -hmm. uh, so all U.S. adults, it's 41%, right? And then there's a mixed bag. It goes from, what is it, 33 to 46 uh, amongst the Christian religions. And the only thing that reasonably inoculates you against a belief is if you come out as an atheist, right? If you can call yourself an atheist, it's only 10. So I'm surprised it's that high, but still, mm. that's a quarter, wow. right, of, of the population versus if you're a, a, a Christian of some sort. Yeah. The thing that's scary to me that is this lower number, the nothing in particular. So you've come out of a religion, you don't associate with any, you're not going to say you're a Jehovah's Witness or a Catholic anymore, but now you believe even more than those people do. That's why I wanted to ask Ooh. the question in the poll. Um, yeah. Well, would you like to look at that? Yes, poll? let's look at that. Let's pull that up. Let me see if I am able to do that. Okay, let me share the results. Okay, can you all see that? I got to stop sharing my screen, I think. Oh, fair enough. Yeah. So uh, so let's go down and look at that. Uh, let's see which question was that about. It was the last question, right? For those who mm -hmm. left a religion and now consider themselves non-religious. Looks like 58% of respondents said that they now believe in fewer paranormal claims than they did previously. Interesting. Yeah. 6% believe in more paranormal claims, though. Mm -hmm. That was interesting. And then 24% uh, have not changed their belief in the paranormal since leaving religion. Hmm. So that's oh, it. I'm looking at these other ones. This is fascinating. So there's at least one person here who believes they have supernatural powers. Um, I don't know nine percent how many that was, but that's interesting. And and some people are not sure if they have supernatural powers. I don't know how that works. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of their powers isn't you know certainty. Mm. Okay. <laughs> so, so that's an interesting. This this poll was very interesting. That leaving religion does not necessarily inoculate us against a particular way of thinking, um, and doesn't necessarily mean that people can let go of different beliefs. So. What do you put that down to, Rob? Is that just humanity being humans being humans or? Hmm. Well, um, I, I believe part of the problem is the, just the way the human brain has evolved. Um, it, it, it's not really as rational as we like to think it is. It, you know, it, it's not also it's not as accurate as we think it is. Uh, we'll see. You'll see the link later for my critical thinking 101, which talks about the the imperfections in you know, the functioning of your brain regarding taking in data, figuring out what it means, remembering the data, and then how you process the data, all of those things we're not really very good at, right? We think we're good, but we're not. And it, it lends us to believe in things which just aren't true. 
Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the logical fallacy aspect of that, which is the thinking process with the data that we have in our heads, uh, you know, is, is, not, is not the best. We're, we're let's say programmed, but like we have evolved to think in certain ways to help us survive and um, have children, right? That's what evolution's about. Um, that's what survival of the species is about. It's, it was for our circumstances on the African savanna. It doesn't necessarily mean it's perfect. It's just good enough than the other creatures around us who we were competing with. And it certainly wasn't, you know, in the vein of a modern society. Uh, it was, you know, where something didn't move more than a few miles per hour, you know, thinking of things like that. Um, you didn't really have to understand everything about the world that we have to understand in the modern world. So it's even easier than it was for our ancestors, I would say, to get screwed up on what's true and what's not. Interesting. Just, yeah. Well, you know, along those lines, we've had a couple of people ask a question in the chat that I'm not sure if you want to address it now or later, but uh, some people are kind of wondering, like, what do you do if uh, someone that you're talking to just doesn't actually value evidence or reason to begin with? Is, is there a way to have these conversations about skepticism and skeptical thinking um, with someone who is either just very, very credulous or, or has some other way of, of deciding the veracity of claims? Helen's putting her thumb up, so I don't know what that means, so I'm curious. I think Helen is demonstrating her magical power. <laughs> <laughs> don't ask <laughs> <laughs> oh man well it, of course it depends on the circumstance it, it, it's just like when you're arguing with someone on the internet you know what do you want out of it, it it's it's very <laughs> unlikely that you're going to change somebody's mind mm -hmm. by you know giving them de demonstrable facts when they're on the other side of an argument and this has been proven scientifically uh if someone has deeply held beliefs and you challenge them with facts, you're more likely to have them come out believing even more strongly what they were arguing in the first place. Wow, uh, the backfire so, effect, backfire, right? Yeah, so, so it doesn't always happen. If it's not something someone believes very strongly, you might make some headway. But the other thing that we learn here at Recovering from Religion is the um, street epistemology approach of Socratic questioning, right? As opposed to saying, no, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, and this is why, look at this link. It's like, why do you believe that? Please explain it to me so I can understand it. And, and that sometimes puts seeds of doubt in their mind. I really, I respect that, Rob, because there's that well-known quote, now I may, I may butcher this, so correct me, that we shouldn't try and use facts and logic to reason with someone if it wasn't facts and logic that got them to that position in the first place. So yeah, if some, emotions... someone famous in the skeptical movement said that. I'm not going to even say who because most people don't agree with it. Uh, right. it, it was, it's more like uh, you, can't, you can't logic and rationalize somebody out of a position they got to when they didn't use logic and rational effect, whatever. But, right. but in fact, that's not true because like many of us here are evidence that that's not true. Right. Sure. There have there have been very famous people who became skeptical activists or atheist activists who were deep into their religion. All right. So and the thing that con convinced them was something like that. Sometimes mm -hmm. a little bit of evidence and it made a, a, you know, a crack in their thinking and they started to think differently. So mm -hmm. that may be that, that phrase you started with may sometimes be true, but you really can't rely on it to be always true. And so you don't you know, it, it's, it's a little it's a little disappointing because then people say, well, I'm not going to even try. Right. Yeah. Right. No, good point. Thank you. Yeah. So we can assist somebody in answer to that question to perhaps open their mind and to see things differently, but we have to do it in the right way in a non confrontational way. Absolutely. So not coming at people like, how could you be so stupid to not know this? <laughs> yeah, that rarely works for some reason. Shockingly. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. It doesn't work with religion and it doesn't work with any other kind of claims, political either. So. Mm, excellent, excellent points. Well, do you want to talk to us about some particular claims? that? Well, so, yeah, the things I think that people may believe more strongly in who were religious than not and come out of it, uh, then maybe if somebody who was raised without a belief, maybe, uh, are ghosts and that ghosts haunt houses and maybe things also they haunt things like Dybbuk boxes, Kenny Biddle, um, or mm -hmm. dolls. 
<laughs> and he had, has some weird ass collection of spooky dolls uh, that are supposedly haunted. I um, recently inherited a very spooky doll that uh, if I believed in, in ghosts and demons, <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was is, is inhabited by one. <laughs> Haven't you seen the movie documentaries about those haunted dolls? <laughs> the documentaries, <laughs> yes. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I, I, I cannot, I cannot watch those. And I, I told Kenny this, I was at his house once and I got, his dolls freaked me out. It's like, this is one of these emotional we talk about this in RFR and religion, right? Coming out of religion, you have this rational center where you've come to decide this is not true, whatever this is, right? And yet there's emotions in your brain which are programmed as a child which are harder to drop. And so, mm. yeah, I don't want to see spooky dolls when I'm sleeping in my room. Yeah, it still <laughs> scares me. I like, I, right? I don't believe in it, and I cannot yeah. look at that doll. And yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> my my other thing is UFOs, and like I said, I was really into that as a kid. That you know, people get abducted and tractor beam through the through their wall somehow. Uh, you know, into the into the alien mm. spacecraft, and they're probed in places <laughs> you don't want to be probed usually. Um, <laughs> So it's like, yeah, I, I cannot watch like any of the movies that are, you know, about that happening, like they're real. Um, yeah. So wow. interesting you say that there's certain things that, you know, are still um, have that sort of, we have our reflexive defenses yep. up against. Um, I can talk then, about it in the daytime, but I don't want to be thinking about it when I fall asleep. Right. Mm -hmm. Especially because the scientific analysis of why the alien abduction scenario can happen is a real thing. It has to do with uh, sleep paralysis, and you know, uh, and the way your brain is operating when that happens, and that's a real thing. So that can happen to me. So you know, I don't want to be thinking of a mode where I get sleep paralysis and I'm thinking of being abducted and probed by aliens. So mm -hmm. I'm going to try not to watch that when I'm going to bed. That's fair. That's that's interesting. Now I know a lot of people deliberately try and challenge the things that used to be really scary to them. Um, like, they're crazy people instance. well i tried it I, I watched one of the most horrific movies i could or horror movies and then i deliberately walked outside on a cold dark stormy wet night Ooh. at 2 a.m to challenge it and to see how my reflexes and i totally hear what you're saying rob you know it caused that visceral reaction in me and you know looking behind the bushes and behind the wall and waiting for the ghost to jump out at me but I deliberately pushed myself almost like uh, therapy to try and you know um, confront the very thing that that was a fear yeah uh, exp exposure therapy I think it's called something yeah. Like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah that makes sense especially if it's something that's debilitating you know I, I don't, I'm not really debilitated by these issues but yeah absolutely if it's something that's changing the way you you live your life that's a, that's probably a good thing to do mm. that's fair well Tell us about that then. You kind of mentioned with, uh, you know, the alien abduction thing that there's some, you know, other reasonable explanation that could explain it, sleep paralysis. What about ghosts and hauntings? Like, is there evidence Ghosts and hauntings. That? Kenny Bettle's ears are parking up. So I'm <laughs> going to share a page here, which is, let's see, share, share, share screen. So, all right. So Kenny's the man uh, about this subject. And I'm actually trying to get him to talk uh, specifically here you're still looking at the kenny page or just click something yes else? yeah uh yeah i, I actually uh, want him to talk about his his experience on that subject specifically so Ooh. i'm just going to give you a little preview because it's amazing I, I he is actually the first speaker i saw at the very first skeptical conference i went to and it was fascinating because i never knew there was such a person Kenny was a ghost hunter. He was deep into it. He was trying to prove that he had photographs of ghosts and he had what? all his equipment that could do that. And then he had the wherewithal to understand eventually that, well, no, this is not evidence of ghosts. I've been fooling myself and all the other people saying it's evidence is wrong. And he's now on the other side of it. So he writes, he does paranormal investigations and he writes from the scientific perspective of, oh uh, yeah, no, you don't have any proof there that you think you have. Oh, that must be so disappointing for the people who think they have ghosts. <laughs> well, maybe unless they're, you know, like, you know, the movies where, you know, they, they want to kill you and drag you into the fireplace mm. in the basement. And, and yeah, think, I mean, if that's, if that's happening. A, that's in your house. So then, you know, yeah. maybe it's not so disappointing if, you've, it's not if you you can see that's not really what you think it is. Yeah, so, so, it might so, be terrifying so, to learn that you, you just have a, a murderer living in your house yeah. or something. It's, it's not a ghost. <laughs> so, so Kenny, in the, if you want to see a, a, a gist, I wrote this article, Kenny Biddle, The Skeptic Investigators, and uh, mm -hmm. it, it gives a summary of his uh, career to date. And you can look at all these articles on his site uh, 
which are amazing because it's like he goes on ghost hunts with current ghost hunters and you know records it and says here are the problems he goes to zach baggins supposedly haunted museum in las vegas and I think he, twice, that's right. He, he was on the do not enter list, but he went with a, a cleverly disguised COVID mask. They didn't know who he was. Zach walked right by him, the owner of the museum, uh, walked right by him. And, you know, Zach Bag, he's written a bunch of articles on this. He's got this museum, which is, I don't remember how much money it is, but it's ridiculous price. And it's like all these things are supposed to be haunted and they have all these backstories and it's just made up crap. Um, so one I was a little bit involved with was a thing called the Dybbuk box, which is this Jewish mysticism claim that this wine cabinet is, you know, uh, is possessed by a demon. And Kenny did the investigation and found out that no, the guy just made it up and he even admitted it, but it's like in Zach Baggins museum. So, and actually they made a movie about it. I forgot the name of this paranormal, the name of it. I don't know. Oh. But yeah, paranormal so activity. That was a scary movie. They, they made, yeah, they made a movie about this. And of course, it probably said based on a true story. And then you find out like all of the stuff like Elaine, El Elaine Warren, uh, the Warrens as a couple, you know, made all this stuff up. They hired people to write stories. And then you get stuff like, I don't remember who's specifically the exorcist, but stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, all these people believe these stories like they were, you know, a, a true story. And yet, yeah, no, the evidence is not there in any way mm -hmm. to show you that they are. So, so Kenny's the guy about that kind of stuff. Um, okay, her, I'm going to have to talk to Kenny later about mm, this. Yep. This is, this We'd is love really to, fascinating. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, that's, so, th so that's that's and, and there's another thing I want to point you at is the Wikipedia page for haunted house. Uh, oh. One of my team members on Wikipedia rewrote that page, and it's a really good description of you know what's what's with haunted houses. You know what is the evidence? Oh. And what's not the evidence. Wikipedia article haunted house. Okay, I just posted that. Yeah. So the things that can cause a visceral reaction in us, the, the noise, the winds, the temperature, the gas leaks, the all those sorts of things that can yeah, result I mean, in people yeah, the, feeling. You know, a lot of reasons, but one of the bottom line is if you're pre-set to believe in something that you're looking for, you're going to come away with evidence you believe reinforces that. Mm. Mm. You know, that that's regarding hauntings or, or anything, really. Yeah. Well, there's a famous series said i want to believe so i i'd love Absolutely. to challenge myself i want to go through you know, a, I, the I most made, haunted building i made this backdrop well i found this backdrop somewhere on the internet i thought it was cool but i was looking for the the compliment to i want to believe with the ufo hanging there and and i want you know i was looking for something that said i want to know right mm. yeah right? i want to know the truth i want to, i googled all that there is no poster there's money to be made in that yeah mm. and kenny's but got a store so maybe you could think about that Ooh, Brilliant. okay well we'll be buying those next week i'm ready <laughs> <laughs> i want to know <laughs> that's great so so i guess spoiler alert if we read that that haunted house wiki we're going to find out there's not a whole lot of evidence for actual hauntings pretty much yeah mm. I, I had my, my my own experience with uh, kenny and that he he invited me and some other friends on uh on a haunted mansion trip and he and, mm. and he and then uh, slept over in the house overnight this is uh the white hill mansion in new jersey oh yes and uh i went and visited but then i saw the place and it was like full of mold and like holes where there could be rats and i was more afraid of that kind of thing <laughs> than ghosts so i didn't stay overnight <laughs> but i stayed well into the evening it was dark i walked up alone in the dark floor because there's no electricity that was working there and i had my phone and i was playing the ghostbusters theme you know i was <laughs> daring them to come out and get me and show me show themselves and and kenny wrote a really good article about that that investigation there but the thing is that mansion is believed to be haunted and you know all ghost hunters go there and they say they find things they find electronic voice phenomenon which mm -hmm. is recordings that supposedly prove ghosts are talking to radio waves and yeah no there's nothing there Oh yeah, don't yeah, let's not even get the into the hole. Was it the e meter or the whatever those contraptions are? Yeah, yeah. Kenny, <laughs> Kenny does a good job because he used to work with some of them, I guess, of you know, diagnosing what those those equipments really do, what they fail to do, and what the ghost mm -hmm. hunters claim they do, which is not really what they do. Mm -hmm. Wow. Interesting. Now that all dovetails in. So we're talking about spirits and, off, you know, spirits are either de demonic entities, according to the, the, the belief, or they are the souls of departed humans. So how, how do you, can you then talk about, you know, maybe proof of the existence of a soul or reincarnation, past lives, 
yeah so, so that's a that's a whole big thing which right religious people are primed to believe in because mm -hmm. probably even if you decide your holy book is wrong with the details well the basics are right and there's some kind of afterlife and a lot of people who leave one religion go searching through other religions because they want that to be true right again i want to believe and this has been programmed into them and therefore they you know go looking for what the older holy books say about that um and then that's reinforced by seeing these stories of ghosts, because what else are ghosts but, you know, dead people, right? Because, mm -hmm. well, actually, there could be other things. People just assume, I don't know what this is. It's a dead person. Mm, how do you know it's not a time traveler that's stuck in an interdimensional warp and you can't <laughs> quite see all of them? It was in a Star Trek episode, Next Generation, like that. Yeah. Um, right. But no, you know, it's, it's definitely a dead person. Um, uh, so, you know, that's one of the things. The, the, and the other thing is, yes, there is all of this new age stuff about astral projection and, you know, consciousness can leave your body. Um, you have a near death experience and you see the light and then people on the other end of that and you either see Jesus or you see Muhammad. Um, and all of this plays into that. Uh, people go to therapists or hypnosis, hypnotists who do past life regression um, you know, claim people were re reincarnated, all of that plays together to reinforce, you know, those initially held beliefs. And, and one thing I've actually heard on the recovering from religion line is people don't know the details of this maybe, but they'll say, yeah, I heard science knows there's a soul. They even weighed it, right? So that's come up more than once. So uh, let me show you the Wikipedia. Like 42 article. grams or something or something. Like Very that. close. 21 grams. 20. <laughs> so always 21 grams. And ah. oh, wait, I, today I had Cheerios <laughs> and I'm looking at the label I ripped off right now. It's got 21 grams of whole grain for serving. <gasps> <laughs> You is ate a, a soul of is that Cheerios. that a marketing, uh, you know, thing on purpose, or is that a wild coincidence? Twenty-one grams whole grain per serving of Cheerios. Okay, so yeah, so you know, th this experiment was done in uh, <laughs> almost medieval times, nineteen oh seven. You know, and this article talks about all of the flaws. Uh, you know, the, and to go down to the last sentence in the lead, the case has been cited as an example of selective reporting. It's been rejected by the scientific community, but it popularized the concept that the soul has weight, specifically as 21 grams. So this is one of the things that, you know, it's, it's out there because once you put one of these things out there and people want to believe it again, I want to believe, maybe you've just been talked about in your church, eh, science has proved there's a soul, near death experience, 21 grams. Uh, you know, it's very hard to shake that because, People don't go looking for stuff that refutes what they have been told and want to believe. So they're not going to go to this Wikipedia article, right? They're not going to Google 21 grams soul hoax, you know, no. But for people who are on the fence and really want to know the truth, it's out there. The truth is out there. The truth is out there. From the other thing. From. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to know. It's just not what Fox Mulder usually thought it was. <laughs> yeah. But that's you a know, good point you make there about... Sorry, Carrie. Oh, no, go ahead. You're good. Well, scientific proof. So people will always find a study that backs up their preconceived notions or biases if they want to. Um, how, how do people actually go beyond and not just look at the, the heading of this so-called study or proof, but actually delve into it? Yeah, so one of, the, one of the ways that I found to do that is if someone makes a claim you're not familiar with, now that we have you know, Dr. Google, you go to Google and you put the claim and you say hoax, skepticism, you know, you know that kind of thing. And it's very easy to find the alternative information, mm. and then you can compare it. And you know, in my experience, every time you do that, you know, the, the original stuff just doesn't hold up. Um, so on on the topic of the soul, I want I want to show one more page before we move on from that. I, I met this person at Psycon, a Wikipedia article, Susan Blackmore. So she, like Kenny, has an interesting uh, experience with this. She actually was a firm believer in out-of-body experiences, and she went to university to try to prove this, right? And she originally wrote something, here it is, but to dismiss the experience of, of uh, out-of-body experiences as just imagination would be impossible without being dishonest in how it had felt at the time, because she had one, right? It felt quite real. Everything looked vivid. So she actually tried to prove this, became a scientist, and then came to the conclusion, 
um, that she talks about her 30 year old out of body experience, convinced her of the reality. Uh, but now she understands uh, after careful experiments and it changed all that. She found no psychic phenomena, only wishful thinking, self-deception, experimental error, and occasionally fraud. And she became a skeptic. And now, you know, she writes on the other side of that. So it's, it's the most interesting thing to me when you find someone who was deep into it, like her or Mr. Biddle, and by investigating, had their minds changed to the point where now they actually preach the other side of it, you know, mm. with, the, with the evidence. And I expect that's also rare sometimes for, you know, people to, to do that, even if, you know, they, they do come to realize that there's not evidence for their claim. You know, it takes a lot for someone to actually then come out and publicly say, actually, I was completely wrong. And let Absolute, me tell absolutely. you Absolutely. Yeah. If we get the fallacies at the end, they actually have a list of them that all play into this. And that is absolutely one of them. Or absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Most, most people, you've spent your whole life in something you are not going to do that. And, and so in recovering from religion, like we have the clergy project for people mm -hmm. who have been trained as a minister, a priest, a rabbi, an imam, and come to decide after investigating it more while they're preaching to people about the stuff that, no, I don't believe this anymore. Then what do you do, right? Mm -hmm. a, a good percent of them, this is the only thing they know how to do to make a living. They have a mortgage to pay off. They have a spouse, maybe who's married them because they're in this religion. So sometimes they just fake it. And we actually have the clergy project to help people get out of that circumstance where they're being hypocrites, right? Yeah. And I don't know what the percent is, but probably not a large number that would leave. And it's probably true of people who are deep into this kind of stuff, whatever it be, you know, saying they do exorcisms or they're ghost hunters or they're, you know, they're, they're mediums to then realize, no, I'm wrong. Okay, I'll just drop it and say it was wrong. It's very hard. Flat yeah. earthers. There have been very few. Flat, there have been some, but very few active flat earthers who had YouTube channels, whoever, who came out and said, "No, now I've investigated it. I was wrong." <laughs> now, Rob, yeah. there's a famous quote that somebody shared with me, and I think it applies. You know, when an honest man finds out that he is wrong, he will either cease being wrong or cease being honest. Mm, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. Was that Mark Twain? Mark Twain I apparently mean, says that. I think so. I, I could have got that yeah. quote wrong. My apologies. If anybody can correct me in the chat, feel free to. But that does apply. People may have, get to a point where their, a conscious decision needs to be made uh, for whatever reason. Maybe they literally can't get out of that situation. Or the, there it is. Oh, that's, that's one of them. That's another one. Yeah. yeah. And again, it's attributed to Mark Twain. I don't know if you really said that, but I have used that quote a lot. And this is so true. This comes to, like you said, well, you know, how do you talk to somebody who believes something, especially mm -hmm. this kind of stuff, who they've seen evidence, it's not good evidence, but they think it's good <laughs> evidence. You know, they've either fooled themselves into believing something, they've been fooled by other people for, you know, to make a dollar, or just mm -hmm. because the people believe it, uh, and they've told them it, and it's very hard uh, to convince them that they're wrong. Mm -hmm. Cognitive dissonance. Yeah, well, that's, that's very interesting. And I guess that that does kind of go back to some of those, again, the, the religious beliefs being kind of wrapped up in, in some of the, uh, the way yeah, people might come absolutely. to these other paranormal beliefs. Yeah, as so well. one of the, the other ones is, is, is the belief that there is precognition and prophecy and Ooh. people have powers to see the future through the supernatural realm, realm in some way, right? And we, we currently call those people psychics. If you're in a religion, you call them a prophet and there's still enough of those around, uh, mm -hmm. right? It's the prophet of the religion. But um, yeah, people who are on the street, they might say it's from God or they might not, but we, we call those people psychics. Uh, people who mm -hmm. go one step further and claim they can talk to, well, have dead people talk back to them are uh, mediums. Right. Mm. And this is also, you know, something that's highly believed by religious folks, because if there's a soul and there's a spirit, then why can't you talk to them? Right. Right. Yeah. And then right. if you start to debunk the idea that you could talk to them, then I wonder if that could also start to make people feel uneasy that the whole thing is beginning to unravel. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. 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 And, and, and in that regard, I've talked to a lot of people who who like, if you try to say, well, we've debunked all these famous psychics, we have run stings on them and we know they're reading face, faked Facebook pages. I always have trouble with that, faked Facebook pages, which we've done stings like that. Uh, they'll say, well, 
yeah, you got that fake person, but my psychic is real because they told me something they couldn't have known any other way but by paranormal powers. So this is, again, uh, you know, I want to believe it. You don't want to be convinced you were wrong, especially if there's an emotional element to it. If you've gone to a medium who's told you you're in communication with your dead child, right? Mm -hmm. It's hard to accept that you were conned. Mm -hmm. You know, Rob, that's interesting too, that a lot of people um, who actually present and expose how these so-called mediums and and psychics operate sometimes people will still believe so you you get well-known examples like your darren browns or whatever who will actually explain how he does it and people will still walk out sometimes and be convinced that's fascinating i've i've heard uh pen and teller say well pen say teller doesn't say anything pen say that after their show they stand out in the lobby and uh they, they have a crowd around them and they answer all the questions and every once in a while they'll have somebody do just what you said well, the trick you did with that way. Tell me the truth. That was magic powers, right? And no, I told you, I can't tell you how I did it, but that was a deception. No, come on. You have secret magic powers. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you cannot convince that person. That's not that. That's not the case. Interesting. (laughs) Yeah. I don't don't know why that happens, but it it apparently does all the time. So, so one thing I wanted to mention regarding, so the skeptical movement, does several things in regard to pushing back on psychics and mediums. We do stings against the famous ones. Uh, Ken was involved in one. Uh, Susan Gerbic writes about them all the time. She sends teams of people in playing roles and the, and the, and the person who's supposedly reading from dead, you know, hearing from dead relatives, feeds back people's mm-hmm. information from beyond that just came from Facebook that was made up by a team of people that the people oh my God. that they're reading don't even know. So mm-hmm. you, they can't later say, oh, I read your mind because the people sitting you know, undercover don't even know what's on the Facebook page and it gets all recorded and say, oh yeah, we wrote that. We put that on the Facebook page. So, you know, but the sad thing is it hardly matters. Um, we... There's, there's somebody named Thomas John, who's very famous because he's been on two networks, uh, the Seatbelt Psychic, and uh, was on one, I think that's Lifetime, and the Thomas John Affair was on another network, a Thomas John Experience, where both cases where he drove around in a vehicle and like read people who got into his car, or he stopped and went into a place and read people there that supposedly didn't know anything about this. But then Susan investigates and finds out, oh yeah, you know, that's an actor they hired. He's on, he's on IMDb for the episode. Um, <laughs> they may not have known that this was going to happen, but the producers knew who this was and were able to give the information out easily and research them. Right. So things like that. But this gets written up, gets covered, sometimes in big places. The New York Times wrote an article about one of these things we did against Thomas John. And yet Caesar's Palace hires him as the house show the next year. You know, Wow. An evening with Thomas John, you'll be amazed. You can talk to your dead relatives. Wow. It's, that must be incredibly frustrating. It is frustrating. Um, James Randi, you know, one of the fathers of modern mm-hmm. skepticism, called them unsinkable rubber ducks. Um, <laughs> and you know, all, all we can do is try to push back as best we can to try to help some people, but not everyone wants to be or can be helped. Yeah, and I guess you've we, got we have some pages people... where we argue with believers in these specific people and point them to the videos, the, the, the New York Times article showing that these people are frauds and they go, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Wow, fake news, it's fake news. Yeah, I guess some people just wanna be entertained too and they'll just um, go along with it. They don't, truth is not as important as holding on to their belief or at the entertainment. That's absolutely true. So, so one of the things people always say is, well, maybe some people are, you know, really have powers and, and they're not the ones famous on TV. They're not putting themselves out. They don't have anything to prove. Well, so there is this thing I'm going to show you now, which the, there used to be a $1 million US paranormal mm-hmm. challenge. It was for decades. Uh, James Randi, James Randi Educational Foundation ran and he retired. So uh, that is no longer in effect, but there is still a group of challenges all around the world that add up to well over a million dollars. The largest one I think is for the organization that I write for, uh, Center for Inquiry. Uh, they're the parent organization that writes for, that makes Skeptical Inquiry magazine. And you could win a quarter of a million dollars by proving you have paranormal abilities of any kind, dowsing, uh, you're a psychic, you're a medium, you can do Reiki, any of these you know, 
energy claims that are nonsense. Um, so all you have to do is apply uh, and, and agree to the test. And it's amazing how many people do this, agree to the test that, that says, oh, yes, definitely, I can do that. And then they just utterly fail. And it's like nobody has ever passed these tests. Now, what happens when, when people apply for these? I mean, do, do you think that they actually believe that they have these powers? So and they're surprised? I, yeah, I, I, I know out? people who are on the committee and I've talked to them and asked them that very question, Car. And it, some of them are mentally ill. All right, right. Mm -hmm. So an example of that was this guy who last summer, so it was during the pandemic, uh, and they did the test in the parking lot. He claimed he can teleport from one chair to another, as long as it was like within 10 feet. And he could also, there's two things, he could move the clouds the way, whatever he wanted. Uh -huh. So, you know, they tried to, well, let's do the chair one. That's easier. Yeah, I can't tell if you pointed the clouds, if it moved because you pointed at it or it moved. But they might have tested the clouds, but I remember the chair one because they said, okay, we're going to put a video camera here. We're going to record you. We want you to do this. And he gets up, moves from one chair, sits down in the other chair and goes, see, I just teleported. Oh. Yeah. Now, I don't know what to make of that other than mental illness because yeah. clearly didn't think he was going to fool anybody. But the, it seems to me from the, from the recorded ones I have watched, most of these people believe they can do what they think they can do because they've deluded themselves. Mm -hmm. Right, it's confirmation bias. People reinforce what echo the, chamber. They do it right. It's an echo chamber. Mm -hmm. Right, if if you're reading tarot cards, you say something to someone, and it's oh yeah 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 that really worked, that helped me. But you know, but then you do it in in a controlled study, and it's just 50 50 or whatever the odds would be. Dowsers mm -hmm. is the most famous one. For people who don't know what that is, it's using rods to find stuff that you can't see with your eyes. It's either buried or it's in a box. It could be water, it could be minerals. Uh, people sold bomb detection devices to, uh, to the uh, armed forces in, in Iraq when America was there that could mm. sniff, can sniff out bombs before they went through control gates. And it's just magical nonsense that you hold rods and they're supposed to be. And that one was unbelievable. You put a, you put a picture of the type of explosive you were looking for in the box, and then the rods would know to point to it if that explosive was in there. And, our, and, and not only the Iraqi army, I think the US army bought this stuff. And, mm. then, and then they found out, oh, the guy bought like golf ball detection devices, which were also bullshit uh, for finding lost golf balls if you hit them you know, in, into the rough. Mm. And they sold them as bomb equipment at like a hundred times the cost and oh. got, got people killed. But so dowsing is that you can hold rods or a pendulum and find hidden stuff. And the people who do this usually believe they can because they know where the stuff is. Yeah. in advance right but as soon as you you double blind it they don't do it any better than chance and then when you show them that they failed oh there's bad energy here because people are skeptical or there was something mm -hmm. wrong you know it's, it's mm -hmm. never that no i'm wrong i don't have these superpowers these magical powers are, are really delicate it sounds like they just just Half only work when you're not testing delicate. them <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting that dowsing or, or as it was also known uh, as divining or water divining wasn't it and so that yeah, led yeah, to yeah water witching, super, water witching right. is another name yeah that, that mm -hmm. there's an almighty or supernatural being guiding the hand and so it all ties into that whole belief structure that whole thinking process right mm -hmm. right so so uh, i think she's gone now because she said she had to leave early uh, susan gerbic uh she is the one who writes all about the mediums and she calls them grief vampires because they mm -hmm. you know, suck the blood, uh, the lifeblood out of people who are already grieving. Mm -hmm. And so you could find her as an author and she talks, uh, she has many articles on a lot of subjects, but a lot of them have to do with showing that these famous mediums are, are just full of it. There's, there's wow. the guy I talked about before, uh, Thomas mm -hmm. John. Yeah. yeah, so one of the more disastrous ones was Operation Onion Ring, Thomas John and the children. He charged eight children, well, their family, $400 to have a Zoom session with him so he can talk to their dead relatives. And they were like, I think it was six to 12 years old. So parents who believe this clearly, you know, wanted to sit down with him and they subjected their children to this. And the really interesting thing about that was of the eight people there, two of them were Susan's plants. These were people mm -hmm. who were pretending to be other people. They were skeptical activists. They were atheists, in fact. And they had put a backstory in which Thomas John just took a line and sinker. He just like, 
there was an initial email that was sent to him. I'd like to sit in, this is my story. And he just read all that back like he was talking to their dead relatives. Wow. You know, and they're sitting there smirking and uh, he's got no idea. And on top of that, there was a blank little panel. He did it on Zoom just like this, which was like the M I'm seeing at the bottom. Well, that was Susan watching the whole thing and recording it. His biggest you know, uh, person that would, that would write about him, his, his biggest villain in his eyes, he knows who she is. He, you know, he says nasty things about her on Facebook and he had no clue that she's recording this whole thing. And two of the, one quarter of the people there were her plants. <laughs> wow. Wow. Where was that skeptical ability to uh, read The psychic that? ability. Ooh, yes. Psychic. No, Thank no. you. Yeah. 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 It just failed. Just, wow. But it was because of all that bad energy in the room. Uh, yeah, I'm, that's right. You, and, you and have it, to want to believe it for it to work. Un- unbelievably, that is the, um, the thing that sometimes people say. Ooh, it's like they're just basically right. outing themselves. Right, I've heard this that only works too, if you're right? very credulous. Right? You, you can only <laughs> right. understand the Bible if you have faith in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Secular reasoning. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. And, and, the, and the last person I want to point to, which is kind of an overlap in the, in the atheist community and the skeptical community, is Holy Kool-Aid. Uh, oh, yeah. Probably a lot of people know who that is, but some people might not. He has a YouTube mm-hmm. channel. He was a he was the um, the child of evangelical uh, missionaries off in Asia trying to convert, I think, Muslims. And he had a change of heart, and now he's got a channel that talks not only about you know the problems with Christianity and religion in general, but also he's great at debunking psychics. He's got so many things on great psychic fails, you know, how we know what psychics are doing and how they're doing these tricks. And uh, so you can, you can go back and forth between his religious videos and his stuff talking about how we know that this stuff is not real. Oh, excellent. Yeah. That's another YouTube channel that I enjoy. So I just dropped a link in the chat, Uh, you know, speaking of that, um, some people have been asking in the chat uh, some variations of, you know, where do people come up with these paranormal beliefs? What makes them believe in them? Why do people believe these things that are seem so outrageous? I think this is all Helen's fault. We'll have to go watch her talk about about <laughs> Wicca and, uh, and, and those kinds of beliefs, because some of it must be from there. But I, I don't know. Most of these are age old issues uh, mm-hmm. that just have been believed by people forever. And then occasionally something new gets tacked on. Uh, like mm-hmm. there's always been something about energy healing of some sort, but mm-hmm. you know, as as time has gone on, somebody in their basement chamber decides, oh, if I touch your spine this way, it really fixes your spleen, and that became <laughs> chiropractic, right? Mm-hmm. Another person looks in someone's eye and sees a spot, and that clearly means you have liver disease, and that mm-hmm. becomes whatever the hell that is. Reflexology. Here, thank you, yeah. thank you, Sasha. The reflexology is all these things you just keep tacking on and they all have to do with energy manipulation mm. and medication and there's no science about this at all there is no proof of this energy there's no way to measure it and in test it absolutely utterly fails just like the dowsing experiments but mm. yet the practitioners think it works homeopathy although not exactly the same thing again someone came up with this idea. mostly if, by the way if someone one person comes up with an idea it's probably wrong this is my own opinion, because all of these things are one person coming up with an idea and then it's spreading. I used to have a thing on my whiteboard at work. The thing that's wrong with humanity is somebody comes up with bullshit and everyone else believes it. And, mm. you know, I, I can name so many things like that. Homeopathy is the low hanging fruit of alternative medicine. It is literally so, right. magic water. Mm. And, yet, and my organization is having trouble suing CVS and, and uh, Walmart for selling it like it's real medication because wow. everyone just believes this. And I think that answers the question I was about to ask you. Um, many people ask questions. They say, what's the harm? Let people believe what they want to believe. They want to believe in ghosts. They want to believe in the paranormal. They want to believe in woo and, and um, you know, alternate medicine. What's the harm in that? I think you've so, already answered. So I, 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 I could go in a little more on that. I, I, I've given presentations specifically, and we can look it up here uh, on RFR. One was, what's the harm in believing in psychics? Uh, one of my favorite or least favorite topics to deal in because it harms so many people. So Bob Nygaard is a private eye who helps people who have been conned by psychics and mediums uh, as best he can, but not many people do this in the country. And you can look at this article and go to the notable psychic fraud cases and read these and they're sad. People leaving, losing hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars of their money and their family's money 
to psychics and mediums who told them that they are possessed or they uh, you know, have some kind of bad juju and, they, and only they can fix it. So this is, this is part of the problem with watching the stuff on TV and believing Thomas John is real. He's the seatbelt psychic, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, I said that, that any network which shows this kind of stuff has blood on its hands because mm-hmm. Thomas John might not rip everyone off for, you know, hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars. But seeing this promoted on the media as if it is real convinces people that Mary Jane, the psychic on the, on the store, on their corner, could be for real, and they go in and trust her. And then some percent of people are going to be ripped off for their life savings. Wow. Probably unnecessarily. So they either they lose financially or they lose their control in over their autonomy and their their thinking. Absolutely, yeah. I I actually got into this, and I'll tell it quickly here. I told a longer version when I talked about the trouble in believing in psychics. Uh, I got pulled into this because I interviewed Bob Nygaard. I wrote his Wikipedia article. Uh, Then I interviewed him. I wrote a Skeptical Inquirer article about him, uh, about all his good work. And because that was on the internet, people were able to Google psychic fraud and come up with my email address because it's connected to my um, skeptical inquirer column. And they wrote me and someone wrote me, I lost my whole life savings, $42,000 to this psychic, please help <sighs> me. Oh my God, like I, I, I'm not in law enforcement, what can I do? She sent me the copies of the court papers and whatever, and as it turned out in her jurisdiction in Connecticut, it's not a crime. She had to sue in civil court to try to get her money back. And mm-hmm. she had no more money to hire a lawyer to do this. So you wow. can see too. So, you know, that, that got me pulled even further into trying to fight this battle uh, to try to prevent people from becoming victims. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's not just harmless fun and... Yeah. And, and, and even any of the things that maybe, okay, maybe you're not going to fall for the psychic losing thing. But when you, when you have a lack of critical thinking and don't understand mm-hmm. human frailties and biases and logical fallacies, you're more likely to, hey, I believe Bill Gates is putting microchips in vaccines mm. and I'm not going to get vaccinated. And then you die and leave your kids alone. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. I, I was going to ask about that. I mean, given, you know, all of the current events and things that, you know, have lent themselves to, to some people, maybe not uh, being very skeptical about some of the claims that have, have come out. Do you have any um, brief advice on on what can people do to inoculate themselves against these kinds of scams and yeah so 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 the the shorter story but it'll take you more time is to go watch my other presentation which is on the rfrx youtube channel uh critical thinking 101 how to inoculate how to inoculate yourself against false beliefs uh but you know but part of that presentation was was showing things like you know, how to understand human biases and how to understand when you're not thinking correctly because you've been convinced of something or you've convinced yourself of something for a very bad reason. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, if we have time, on logical fallacies. Yeah, Yeah, let's do it. We got a few minutes. Okay. So let's see. Okay. So I'm going to share this and hopefully it shares all the pictures at once when I click it. Okay, if I, if I click through this, do you see more than one? Is it going through them? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. All right, so I do, I have done a Logical Fallacy of the Week series, literally every uh, Monday, I think it was, I released one a week for 52 weeks. And this was to, to, to discuss these things at work when I was still working with people. And then I posted them online on my public Facebook page. And uh, I'm re-releasing them now as we speak. But what I, what I did today was I went, I pulled out the ones that most are applicable to paranormal beliefs. Uh, especially, you know, from people coming out of a religion. So all of these things help one believe in the wrong thing, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go through them quickly here. Use of anecdotal evidence, right? It's, It's our tendency to believe our own observations or what other people tell us that they've observed over what science tells you from the consensus of experimentation, right? That, that, that's a big one. Uh, you know, well, oh, science shows homeopathy is just literally water. Well, my friend said it works and she mm-hmm. cured her migraines. Therefore, mm-hmm. it works. Right? Mm-hmm. Appeal to authority, right? When you're coming out of a religion, you always had an authority telling you what was the truth. This is someone, something which is kind of human and religion takes advantage of it, but so do all these nonsense claims, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Pretty much anybody will stand up on television. I understand this better than anyone. And this is the truth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No. 
the man uh, in the white emotions. coat. Right. Yeah. So, so, so um, the, the, the way I formatted these was a description of the, of the logical fallacy and then an example, which was all different things. So I'm not gonna read through the examples because some of them don't pertain to what we're talking about here, but each of the fallacies can be used you know, to get you to believe a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So you know, appeal to emotion is like, oh, how could you not believe there's an afterlife in a soul? That would be horrible, right? Mm -hmm. Therefore, that's a good reason to believe it. No, right? Appeal to possibility. This is less known, right? This is when you assume it's true because there's a possibility for it to be true, mm. right? No, there could be many possibilities. It doesn't mean it's true. This is a big one in religion, as well as in what we're talking about tonight, right? Something is true or beneficial because it's been believed or practiced for a very long time, whether that's your religion or, you know, a traditional Chinese medicine and acupuncture. Mm. Mm -hmm. How could it be wrong if people have been practicing it for centuries? Absolutely. And, <laughs> and they say it's true. You combine these fallacies in one statement mm. and it sounds like it's, it can't be wrong. Millions of people have believed it for thousands of years, right? And everyone tells me it's true. That's three They're logical fallacies. And that is right. enough to get somebody to believe anything when they don't understand that is fallacious reasoning and you shouldn't make a decision that way. Uh, this one you hear a lot on calls to the atheist experience, but it's true for this, these subjects too, right? I don't understand how, how can a door close in a room where no one's there? It has to be a ghost, right? The, the, the example here was intelligent designer created the universe, but it's the same kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it can't be the other way. It's a ghost. Um, this is similar, right? Argument from ignorance. I don't understand. The, uh, the, the other one is I don't understand. This one is it isn't understood right? Mm -hmm. It just has not understood. It has, you, you have not proved there are no ghosts. Therefore, there are ghosts. Mm -hmm. uh, and we talked about this, right? Argument to the people. So many people believe it has to be true. Everyone believes in ghosts. Probably slight exaggeration, but a huge percent too, maybe 40%. So shifting the burden of proof. Yes, you have, you have not proved that uh, mediums cannot talk to the dead. Therefore, I'm going to assume they do. Mm -hmm. Right? This is a rare one, but I found this very fascinating. Um, you know, yeah, you've proved, my example here would be, you've proved uh, Tyler Henry and Teresa Caputo, the Long Island Medium, and, um, and Thomas John and Matt Fraser, name all the psychic mediums that are on television. Yeah, you've scammed, you've busted them all. We haven't busted them all, but say we did, right? But that doesn't prove there's not somebody out there who's real, right? <laughs> it doesn't prove they're all fake. So in, in other words, if there are so many examples, something has to be true. And no, it doesn't. No. Right? Incomplete evidence, uh, kind of similar, but it's basically you yourself ignoring the disconfirming information. This has to, it's kind of like confirmation bias. It's the way you go do it, right? You cherry pick what you want to look at. Uh, counting the hits and ignoring the misses. Mm. Exactly. Uh, yeah, hasty generalization. Uh, yeah, it's just, yeah, that's similar. Yeah, well, yeah, probably. Uh, I, I, the, the things move around in the, in the dark and you hear weird voices and probably a ghost. <laughs> and this is what we were talking about before, sunk cost fallacy, right? I'm so far into this that the consequences to my maybe finances or, or maybe just emotional well-being to back out is horrible. <laughs> so you, you, you also call the argument from inertia. It's hard to change direction. Uh, to pay fallacy. Uh, let's see, let me, an example of this would be, well, I, I know a ghost when I see one. <laughs> like, <laughs> do is, you? <laughs> do you really? Like, there's no scientific ghost in a jar that you can compare the ghost you think you've seen to. Like, right. So like, how can you do that? So, so those are some of the ways and they all combine in people's heads to make them believe these unfortunate wrong things that can in fact be dangerous to your pocketbook or even well-being right those yeah. were brilliant can you put that in the chat again the link for if anyone's missed it and we'll put it afterwards but that was yeah fantastic. i'll drop it again yeah, yeah so so i had the link great. that you you could copy to um to Kara, uh, to there yeah is. that's it Right. There it is. Right. Yeah, I just had a certain set of those, but all, those are all 52 that I decided to use. That's Logical excellent. Fallacies of the Week series on Facebook. And it, and it was going on, by the way, during the Trump administration. So some of them are somewhat political. 
Fair enough. It, actually, there was an interesting podcast called Fallaciously Trump. And every <laughs> week was just discussing his latest tweets or pronouncements and saying all the logical fallacies. So this is oh my goodness. That's that's great. That must have been really therapeutic for whoever was making that. <laughs> mm. Well, Rob, we are getting close to running out of time. Before we go to some questions, do you have any uh, final points that you want to share with us? Um, no, I think I covered pretty much what I wanted tonight. It was a great opportunity to be able to do all of that at once. It's, it's of course, a very small subset, as I said before, of what the skeptical movement is involved with. But I think mm -hmm. it's one of the big ones that might resonate with recovering from religion clients. So glad I got yes. to do it. Oh, Thank I you. am too. This has been great. I was looking forward to this talk for a while. And every time you give a talk about this, it comes up in, in subsequent shows and hangouts for weeks afterwards. So <laughs> looking forward to the, the follow-up questions and comments. <laughs> I'm curious and, if there was one person, and I don't remember if it was an RFRX. No, yes, it was. It was late at night. So by the way, after after the talks are done in RFRX for people who don't know, we keep the video chat stream going. And sometimes people stay on till like three in the morning, East Coast time, just chatting. Um, so one of those nights I was on late, it was down to maybe 10 people. And someone asked me about the psychics and I talked it, and the woman interrupted, don't say anything bad about psychics. I'm a psychic. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> you were there? Yeah. Yes. And you've been through the whole presentation. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. well, there's um, fantastic material today, Rob. Thank you. And lots of questions were coming through. The chat was running hot. And apologies if we've missed any questions. It wasn't intentional. We just literally couldn't keep up with everything that was being sent directly to us or via the chat. Um, so we do apologize. We've got a list of a few questions. Have we got time to throw a few more of those at you, Rob? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. Um, leave it to you, Cara, which ones? All right. Um, yeah, we can trade off. Um, let's see. We've got a few on here that I've collected so far that we haven't talked about yet. Uh, you know, someone was wondering um, if you know, um, are there any uh, biological uh, things that might correlate with higher or lower levels of skepticism? Someone's wondering, are there certain brain regions that are more active when someone is engaging in, in skeptical thinking or any particular genetic components that might predispose people in that direction? Or do you know if there's ever been any kind of brain scans or anything done about this? I, I haven't seen anything about the physiology of the brain in that regard. There could be, I just don't know. But uh, I have read articles about personality types um, <clears throat> who are more prone to believe some of these things. And I don't know if the science is good in those articles, by the way, because psychology <clears throat> is a really hard thing to run, you know, repeatable experiments on and all that kind of stuff. But in it, th there was some, you know, some notion that needed to be replicated and whatever that people of certain personality types were definitely more prone to believing in things because their gut wanted them to rather mm. than people who have the tendency perhaps like me uh, to want better evidence and think about it non-emotionally. Mm. Well, that's really good. And that ties in with another question somebody gave us is how do we deal with someone who doesn't truly understand what evidence is? Doesn't that's a that's a tough one and that is a big problem i have personal friends who that is the problem it's like what they accept as you know, we started with the, the the phrase carl sagan is famous for extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence they didn't agree on what extraordinary was and if you can't get an agreement on what is at least sufficient evidence it, it's hard to come to an agreement on like what you're going to agree is real and, and true because yeah like a friend would say I, I saw a picture on google search and there's a giant skull about the size of a whole person there's evidence rob like <laughs> you know, it's not sufficient evidence it's evidence <laughs> it's not sufficient evidence for you to believe in extraordinary thing like there was humans that were 100 feet tall um but in his mind for some reason that i cannot fathom it was enough. And part of it, Sasha, is because he told me so. He wanted to believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a friend of mine. I'm not going to use his name. If he ever listens to this, I'm sure he wouldn't. But <laughs> it, it was, we always head to head arguments about these things, polite at work. He was on the believing everything side, pretty much. And I was like, 
really? Why do you believe that? And one day we were talking about um, aliens. He really was into aliens. Aliens run the U.S. government. There's alien bases under all of the airports in the U.S. There's mm -hmm. alien bases on the far side of the moon, all that kind of thing, right? And I was finally showing, no, there's not this, there's, there's evidence is not here. And he just stopped the discussion and said, Rob, if you take this away from me, I have nothing to live for. Right. Wow. I thought, and that's a wow. That's right. So, okay, okay. I got to go talk to you later. It's like, wow, if that's true, you know, I don't want you to go off yourself, but like, it wasn't even the soul we were talking about in religion. He is just so invested that he has this scoop on these things that science doesn't believe in, but he thinks are true, that it's so important to him that if apparently, if it were shown to his satisfaction not to be true, he would have nothing to live for. Right. Wow. So some people are defined by their belief structures, whatever they are, and you take that away. It's a sunk cost fallacy, as you spoke about. You take that away. They're so invested in it. What defines them? Who are they? Um, yeah, that's very interesting. It's sad. Wow, that really is. Well, and really kind of makes you uh, kind of put in perspective, you know, we're, we're talking about all of these, you know, oh, how are we going to have better conversations with people and get them to, you know, understand my evidence and things like that. But also, you know, going back to what Sasha was talking about earlier, you know, the importance of putting people first uh, when we're having these conversations and not not having them in a way that's harmful um, as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah, that's, wow, really interesting. Um, well, on that note, um, there are a few more questions still, but um, I'm wondering, Rob, are you going to be available to stick around for the Hangouts I, at all? Uh, I just need like a two-minute break. Oh, yeah, and, absolutely. And Absolutely. If you need um, to go and speak to aliens for a couple of yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah, sure. the, the, Ill the Illuminati are cast. I'm getting mm -hmm. texts from the Illuminati. They're, they're really right. mad at what I was saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go go commune for a okay. little bit, you know, okay. get, make right some back. predictions. <laughs> Absolutely. And we'll we'll wrap up here. But yeah, if we didn't get to your question yet, uh, stick around. Rob is going to be here a little bit longer. Um, but I do want to uh, go ahead and wrap up so we can get to the hangout. Um, and we do so appreciate uh, Rob coming on and talking with us about this important topic. Um, and again, be sure and check out his other uh, episodes that he's done as well. I'm going to drop the links to those in the chat. Um, and also, well, I say I am, here they are. Yeah, he's talked to us about critical thinking and about the harmful uh, harm in believing in, in things like psychics and mediums. So definitely check those out for more of the same. And then, um, as always, I want to let y'all know that this is not the last episode of Recovering from Religion, um, RFRX. We do this every week. And next week, uh, we're going to have another guest who is coming back uh, for... I can't even remember how many times, uh, but we'll have David Teach out again, joining us to talk about the dynamics of intuition and simplicity, why it's so enticing. So that will be an excellent kind of follow on to this topic. Um, mm. And a little short description of that is that uh, platitudes and pithy statements are so enthralling, even when supposedly dedicated to reason and rationality. Just follow the science. The truth will set you free. Uh, trust your intuition. I'm doing heavy air quotes on all of those are just a few examples of simple and seemingly deep platitudes. Um, so in this RFRX, David Teachout will join us once again to explore why these platitudes are so enthralling. Uh, and we'll cover ways to reinvigorate our humility, delve into the scout mindset, as well as learn to acknowledge that religion isn't the source of our irrationality. We are. <laughs> so we'll be looking forward to that next week. Uh, I'm yeah. looking forward to that. So please feel free to, to join us live or, of course, catch up with the recording on YouTube. Speaking of which, all of the previous presentations, as we mentioned in the introduction, can be found on our YouTube channel. Sometimes it takes us a couple of weeks just to edit them and get them uploaded. So bear mm -hmm. with us. Today's presentation, for example, will probably be up next month or so. So feel free to check back in and, and send them to others. One thing we encourage people to do is um, share the material that we produce with people. If you think that it's of benefit or relevance, share it on your socials, your, your Facebook pages, your 
Instagrams, TikToks, whatever, and we have all these socials as well. Um, so if you would like to follow all of our social media accounts, you can do that. You can find our Facebook account, you can find our TikTok account, our Instagram account, our Twitter, etc. cetera. Um, we'd love for you to be able to share the material that we post there with other people as well. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. Um, we love to see that engagement and, and be able to find new people uh, that want to come and join us here. No, we really want to just thank everybody for being here today. There's some excellent questions and great participation and um, really encourage you just to continue to join us for all of these presentations and keep in touch with us and let us know of further ideas. But yeah, thank you all for being part of it. Yeah, absolutely. This was a fantastic episode. And Helen, I cannot wait to hear your closing thoughts. Take it away. Yeah, so I always love um, these talks with Rob. Um, I love learning more about like our own fallacies, our own shortcomings in the way that we think and how these things develop. So thank you, Rob, so much. Um, again, thank you to Cara and Sasha. You guys are wonderful. You're my friends and I love you very much. And you do such, uh, such a wonderful job hosting. This was great. Um, I'm going to also remind everybody that not only will these talks be on YouTube, if you have a Spotify account if you have apple podcasts you go on your um, podcast and listen to these while you're hanging out at work or you're going for a jog or you're cleaning your house all of our previous recordings are there so you can that is another place you can find these podcasts also let, let, to, let me interject before you go on that helen did a presentation on being a wicked high priestess and that is on the podcast right yes now. you can listen to my podcast on paganism thank you for that plug rob i appreciate it and other and rob's other talks are also too on these podcasts so check those out as well uh, more talks on critical thinking skepticism and how to question and be a more inquisitive more thoughtful analytical person so that is the whole goal of becoming more educated and better in the way that we think and how we approach things also too we, again i'm going to emphasize that if you are interested in doing what we do being part of this wonderful community please consider being a volunteer i'm going to ask again to put the link in for the volunteer um, application in the chat please join us we will join we are we will find a home for you so please consider volunteering again thank you so much for being here everyone that is here thank you again for joining us please come join us next week and we hope that you got something out of this and that the rest of your week is wonderful and happiness finds you and all that great stuff so thank you again and everybody have a great night